you're either afraid of a rival gang or you're afraid of police. It's tiring. When you come up, when you're 30 years old, your, your friends have, have got their own families. It's very scary because, you know, you are the only one still stuck in that same rut, in that same cycle. It started in secondary school, you know, um, mainly hanging out in basketball courts and, you know, um, not going home at night. Fifteen years old, I was in, in my first gang. Subsequently, in, in my second gang, it got more serious. I got into fights, you know, was introduced to drugs as well. I got to meet um, different uh, gang members from different hierarchies within the gang. The common um, trait that most gang members have is that you have all these like, notions of loyalty and yeah, I think that was part of the draw. That sense of wanting to, to you know, um, find friendship, you know, have a sense of belonging. Yeah. The first illegal thing that I did, I was waiting with a whole bunch of his other friends uh, for, for this guy. Lah. Because we were in a large group, so police came and subsequently we were handcuffed. I was terrified. But at the same time, you know, I think a part of me was like, hey, you know, this is what, this is like part and parcel of, of, of being a gang, right? One of the more serious uh, cases I had, I was caught in a warehouse with um, 3,599 cartons of um, contraband cigarettes. The warehouse was raided and you know that was the first time I, I went to um, the back then subordinate courts. I guess in a you know in, in a gang the, the there is a prevailing sense of justice. You know, like for example if this person do, do this does this thing to you and then you know what what do you do in return? What happened was one of my childhood friends, you know, told me that or you know there's this group of people who messed up with his mother's ice cream cart. So I roughly knew where this group of people usually hang out. And then when they were like walking past me, I, I took out a knife and I started chasing after them. Yeah. So um, unfortunately, you know, like what, one of the guys was uh, was too slow, and then you know, I yeah, I I, I, I swung the, the knife at, at his leg. I could feel the knife sink into the the, the shin bone. Yeah. It was a shopping mall and you know, that there was a Starbucks outside and there were you know there, there were people there and I was just running away and yeah the fear really sets in after you have done it. That was also the first time that I went to um, um, Queenstown Remand Prisons. The boys hostel was for the contraband cigarettes as well as um, illegal visitors. We would have certain duties like you know um, cleaning up the, the toilets, um, sweeping the floor etc. But I quickly got um, very bored of it, you know, so I think um, about two weeks into my stay at the hostel, I, I ran away. I took drugs again, uh, specifically ecstasy. So when I surrendered at the hostel, after a week, I was sent to um, Sembawang um, DRC. They also discovered that I was wanted by a, a different police division. And then from there, I had another two charges. I was sentenced to reformative um, training. So that was in um, the new Changi prison um, complex. I was there for about 20 months. I became really interested in writing because I started reading a lot of books. I actually had this um, bundle of judgments, so I started reading it. I realized that there was this um, very good style of writing, of course, by the judges. I could see like the use of good language. Yeah, so I think that that, that was something that attracted me. I think back then, whatever goals that I had after my release was more practical and, you know, basically did a construction degree again. But, you know, like throughout the entire period when I came out, you know, I was always reading about the law. I just didn't ever think that I would be able to study law one day, but, uh, you know, I nonetheless just, you know, in my own free time, read up. 
I got an opportunity to work in a law firm doing business development and, and, and marketing. Yeah, it was really working in law firms that intensified my, my, my goal, you know, or my dream back then to, to want to become a lawyer. I think that was in about 2013, you know, um, back then it was announced that, you know, the government would be, you know, forming a new law school. So I guess it, it just came very naturally that I wanted to apply there. I'm in year three of my law school right now. I think in future, um, I would like to generally be in the litigation role. At the same time, I would like to do um, criminal law, um, specifically because, you know, I, I have been in the shoes of an accused person as well. As an ex-offender, you know, you, you go out there and, and you start from ground zero in relation to your friends, in relation to maybe your education as well. Whether be it a job application or traveling overseas even, you know, these things would follow you. What I can foresee is that, assuming I eventually um, go on to be caught to the bar, you know, um, I expect that, you know, my, my past uh, would once again surface. Hopefully, it, this isn't an issue. Yeah. I think people would know of um, the idea of a social contract with, with society, but I don't think people think of this enough. When you are in a gang, you live in your own ecosystem, right? But obviously, your actions still impact other, other people as well. But I guess, you know, um, at the end of the day, first and foremost, you should do it for yourself. You owe a personal obligation or responsibility to yourself you know, to live your life meaningfully, right? I've harmed others, you know, as a result of my actions, yes. But I think the question should be whether you feel like a failure to yourself. Because at the end of the day, it is yourself going through all these missed opportunities.